Well, we, we have some time for questions. Um, one popped into my head, and I'm going to take the liberty of asking it uh, straight away. Um, it, it, it's probably trivial. With appropriate modifications for curvature, can you tile a sphere, the surface of a sphere, with your tiling? Unfortunately not. Well, you see, this problem came up with the transbay thing, you see. Yes. Because they have think of it. surfaces. It's it's not so bad, because although they curve one way, they kind of curve the other way. So it makes mm -hmm. up for it. Uh, right. Whereas with a sphere, the curvature is all in one direction. Mm -hmm. And so you can't do this kind of tiling on a sphere. I mean, you can do limited things like you know, subdivide icosahedrons and so on. Right. But then it's not altogether clear there isn't something you might do which, which you know, you throw away another rule, you see. That's the basic thing. Can you think? Something is almost something, you see, which it used right. to be exactly something, yes. and it's only almost something. And it may well be that you can, you see, you could probably do something which is more fractal-like, so it has dense. And in fact, the, the, um, the diffraction pattern, which I showed in the corner of the, of the, of the, the big poster picture, um, that is actually like that. Where you see sharp points. There are these things which used to be called Bragg peaks, which indicates crystal. If you get these sharp Bragg peaks, that tells you it's a crystal. But if you have it's a crystal, it's got to have the proper crystal symmetries. So here was a contradiction. You had sharp Bragg peaks, but it's not a crystal. You don't have crystal symmetry. And that was the great puzzle that Schechtman was presented with. But what you do have is a sort of fractal nature that you have the bright peaks and between them dimmer ones and then between right. dimmer ones and dimmer ones. Right. So they're all there yeah. at, at all levels. And it might be that you could do something of that nature on the sphere. Mm -hmm. but, but that's right. another issue. I suspect you could, but it's got the wrong topology and there are theorems about what you can do with different topologies. Right. OK. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so questions? Uh, yes, please, in the middle there. Do we have a, we probably have mics, yes, if you can wait until a mic reaches you. Penner's tiling uh, tiles only non-periodically, as you said. How close to Penrose tiling can you get while still maintaining periodic, uh, periodic tiling? Is it possible just to change the shape, just to change the kite and dart a little bit so that they would tile periodically, or? No, that's, you can't, no. Well, you, see, you can change them a bit and keep the pattern, like is what I did with the, it, with the overlays here. But um, no. <laughs> I'm afraid that, at least again, maybe there is some way of breaking the rules in a different way. But uh, th no, there is a fundamental problem with, with uh, even if they're not quite symmetrical or something, it's, it's a more serious problem than, than being the right shape. Sorry. Oh, OK. All right, let's, let's, let's have it then, if it's related. A related not? question. But no? I'll come, come to you in a minute. OK. From, from the diagrams in the, in the small scale, you can see mirror symmetries to quite a scale. So at some point, if you put a mirror, it's mm. going to go wrong in your pattern. But the, the point is, can you produce lines which produce the minimum of number of new parts by just put it, placing a mirror, and then, and then you effectively create a quasi-Penrose you know, quasi tiling, but actually um, repeatable, but you've got a few little mirror Mm. faults, if you like, on the, on the mirror boundaries. That's the well, if you can always have one reflection symmetry, which, in fact, the, the design in the Mass Institute, New Mass Institute building, the Andrew Wiles building, um, if you continu continued it to infinity, would have a line of symmetry. So there would be one reflection symmetry in it. And you could have exactly one mirror symmetry. But if you had another mirror symmetry somewhere else, then you, you've got periodicity. So then... Two line, two mirror. Well, either you've got two parallel lines of mirror symmetry, and then you've got periodicity in that direction because you can keep reflecting and reflecting and reflecting, like a hall of mirrors. You see, it keeps on going. Or if you have two mirrors at an angle, then you would have, if it's a rational angle, you would have a certain uh, uh, rotational symmetry, uh, so or you might not. You 
Well, you might be able, if you don't mind having an infinite number of different shapes. Then, <laughs> but if you've got a finite number of different shapes, then you're in a bit of a problem. <laughs> I, I can't see anything sort of in the line of what you're saying, which I could see you know, would, would be possible so to do. A finite, on a a finite number of different shapes. But have you got just one mirror or lots of mirror symmetries? So if you've got one mirror symmetry, yes, you can, you can, I mean, this does it. But if you've got more than one mirror, you've got two reflection lines, if they're parallel, then you have a periodicity because they keep reflecting each other and get a hall of mirrors. So that's a periodicity in that direction. Or you have an angle, and then you have a rotational symmetry about that point. If it's, if it's a, say, a decent rational angle, then you would have a rotational symmetry. So uh, I can't see anything that you could do but it may be I um, haven't thought of the, the correct way of generalizing these tilings to make something like that. Uh, could you say something about the higher dimensional analogs and, and how yes. much maths there is to do? Yes. Well, the first, I mean, I, I sort of realized you could do something with higher dimensions, but I didn't really work at it. But Robert Amman, who very quickly got in he remarkably early got onto these things and produced several non periodic tilings of different kinds, including he rediscovered the rhombus one with only a minimal piece of information. Now, Martin Gardner announced that he was going to describe this sort of thing in his next article. In the meantime, Robert Amman <laughs> rediscovered the Robert rhombus tiling from a minimal amount of clues as to what he was going to do, which was quite impressive. But then he did develop some other ones. Um, I've forgotten exactly what the question was, sorry. Uh, with, oh, three dimensions, that's right. And then he developed a, a version with what are called rhombohedra. This is also Kepler, incidentally. <laughs> Used these three-dimensional rhombus shapes of two different kinds. There's this shape called the rhombic tricontahedron, which is um, if you take a regular dodecahedron or a regular icosahedron and file down the edges until they meet in the middle, you have a uh, rhombuses making a, 30 of these rhombuses making what's called a rhombic tricontahedron. And you can subdivide that into these Kepler um, rhombus, rhomboi, rhombohedra as they're called. And uh, Kepler already did this and, and you can continue those. The, the Robert Amman tilings were based on the Kepler rhombuses and he had two versions of each with different matching rules. I'm not sure if anybody ever checked to see was what his claim was actually right on it. He said they would tile only non-periodically. I think he probably is right. <coughs> um, but later on, people use much more sophisticated ways of getting these tilings. What, there's a mathematician called De Bruyne, a Dutch mathematician, who discovered that you could produce these tilings by going into higher dimensions. You have a cubic lattice or a hypercubic lattice in five or six dimensions depending on whether you want to do two-dimensional or three-dimensional. And you then take this cubic lattice and you slice through it with the right angle and you see which points of the lattice lie within that sl slab and then you project orthogonally and then you can produce these tilings. It's a way which, if you put all that on a computer, it actually is the way to do it. If you want to produce these tilings, well, it's the way. There's two of the ways, if you like. The hierarchy way, which is the one I showed you, is a pretty good way. But this is another way of doing it where you can generate these things in a computational way by going up into higher dimensions and then slicing and projecting. Now, these, uh, there are versions of these things done partly by the slicing and projecting method where you get four different shapes which will tile only non-periodically. There is something else which maybe I brought for this. Yes, I did. I'm going to need to go back to the... Can I go back to the visualizer? This is a tile shape produced by Schmidt, Conway, and Danza, which is a very simple, it's, not, it's aperiodic in a certain sense. What you have, imagine a diamond shape, rhombus, and on the top of it, you put a little roof. See, the diamond is in the middle here. You put a, top, a roof on the top with vertical ends to it and then some slope like this. On the bottom, going the other way, you put a roof upside down on the bottom. 
but so that the angle between the, uh, the top of the roof here and the bottom roof is some irrational angle. Now, you can tile free space with that. First of all, you just make a rather unpleasant complex of buildings like this by putting all the roofs together, rather too tight for comfort. And then you see on the bottom, you're going to have these roofs again, but tilted at an irrational angle to what you have at the top. And then you can fit them together by putting them another row on top, you see, like this, but with a twist. And the angle being irrational means that it's not periodic. It will, however, sometimes have a screw symmetry. So it's periodic in a certain sense that you can twist and it repeats. But you have only one shape. So that's quite an interesting idea, rather simple, di rather disappointingly simple in a way. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's, that's what they do. So that's a sort of answer to your question. But the ones which I think are more in line with what I've been talking about, yes, indeed, there are ways of doing it. I don't know how few you can get away with, how many tiles, but you can certainly do it with four. Um, I'm not sure what the... What the uh, there are suggestions that you can do it with one, but with tiles which are funny sorts of, either they're disconnected or linking to each other, they're not proper tiles in some curious way. Yes. I think you once speculated that the development of quasi-crystals in nature was caused by uh, quantum action at a distance. Mm. Has anything actually, um, is there any further knowledge of that? I don't know. Um, I don't, you see, I have talked to people about this. Is this something they feel is mysterious or not? Well, it's possible that the thing t assembles itself wrong and then kind of corrects itself in some way. But that correcting itself could hardly be classical because, you know, if there's something wrong in the middle, you've got to <laughs> correct itself all the way right out to the edge in some way. I don't know is the answer to your question. <laughs> At least that's my answer to the question. I, I, I'm pretty sure there's got to be some quantum mechanical... So, so the Nobel Prize, which was awarded, was just for discovering it rather than explaining yeah. it. I don't think... I think there are unexplained issues to so, this. So you, you the think there way. may be some kind of quantum entanglement between well, the atoms as they assemble? It may well be. Well, you right. see, it's... I mean, how... You see, to me, there's, there's a deep issue here. I mean... What, what is a gas, you see? Well, lots of atoms running around, you see. Well, those atoms are quantum things. Now, are they running around in definite positions? Or are they just some great entangled thing where they don't have individual positions? They're just part of some big wave function. And only does that wave function resolve itself. So when you have a crystal, then it's a big solid thing which uh, you might argue, well, I mean, it, it, it borders on the foundations of quantum mechanics. How do you get classicality out of quantum mechanics? You don't, is the answer. That's my answer, anyway. That you need something beyond quantum mechanics. So I think there are deep issues here. That is a crystal something where the atoms are really localized in certain places, yet the gas, or you know, may have a vapor, which, which crystallizes on that thing. Now, are those, do those atoms know where they are when they're in the gas? When they stick themselves on somewhere into the crystal, that somehow that wave function has reduced itself. And that process of reducing its wave function onto having a specific local location is something actually outside. It's not just quantum mechanics. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's on the borderline between quantum and classical mechanics, which is not understood. Mm -hmm. My own view is, is that the explanation of what's going on there will involve something really quite deep. And even going beyond our present-day understanding of quantum mechanics. But that's, for, that's another time, for mm -hmm. another time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. There was a question, there were a few questions here. Yes, yes. Um, got the mic. Yes. Someone, it's okay. Yep. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, this may be a little tangential, but uh, if you've read Stephen Wolfram's uh, New Kind of Science, uh, and he also looks a lot at patterns, uh, a lot at cellular automata, yeah, sure. Uh, but other types of patterns, and if you found it interesting, uh, uh, yeah, it's kind of an open question, I guess. It's certainly interesting, what he's done. And, uh, you know, I like looking at his big fat book. <laughs> um, there's a lot in there. 
I, I think calling it a new kind of science is perhaps going a little far. <laughs> it's, it, I mean, all these cellular automata things, there's a lot in there, and there's a lot of interesting uh, logical issues involved. You can have cellular automata which reproduce themselves or which do reflect certain non-computational problems in mathematics and so on. But I can't really believe that's the way nature works. It's an interesting idea. Well, he goes beyond cellular automata in there as well, right? He has yes. all other things, and he tries to describe nature with yeah. graph theory, I believe. Sure. Uh, but, uh, and he also looks, by the way, at Islamic architecture uh, to try and see if, if they had done anything with cellular automata, which they hadn't. Uh, so, but, so who, Islamics? Oh, I see. Yes, as well, well. <laughs> which is quite interesting. Yeah. I think well, I wouldn't want to get too carried away by it. Okay. But, I mean, it's interesting, fascinating stuff, but I, I wouldn't get ca well, too carried cause, away. Because what's interesting there also is um, when he looks sometimes at levels of complexity, <laughs> yes. uh, he mixes what you're doing. He takes the simple rules that he you know, iterates a, a certain pattern. And then just by looking at it, he'll see something very interesting uh, mm. uh, in terms of how, whether or not it's repetitive or how complex it is. And, and what, like, did you, have you looked at his like, Wolfram types between like type 3 and type 4? I haven't actually studied okay. it, so I, anyway, I don't think sorry. I know what that So the, the assembly, assembly of these tiles isn't a cellular automaton, is it? It's an no. algorithmic no, process, but not, not a cellular, cellular automaton. So. Well, there are some interesting questions there. I mean, first of all, there is a set of tiles, some horrendous number of them, which will only tile the plane, will tile the plane, but only in a non-computable way. That is to say, there is no computer algorithm for telling you how to do it. Right. Now, it's a purely theoretical discussion which involves combining two mathematical theorems together. <laughs> and it's a horrendous thing. I, I would be very interested to know if somebody can produce a, a nice test of you know, 15 different tiles or something, which will only tile non-computably. Right. It would be a very interesting yeah. question. I mean, that general tiling problem is non-computable in the sense that if you're given a number of shapes, I think it meant, I touched on that earlier. Can you tell whether or not they will tile the plane to infinity? And there is no computer algorithm for deciding that problem generally, That's interesting. which is something which interested me for other reasons. Mm -hmm. And in the process, I designed a, this interested connection with the Wolfram book, in fact, because I designed, you can make a sort of toy universe which is based on one of these tiling problems, you see. And that just to show that you could have a universe which was non-computable, which was purely deterministic, in fact, but which was non-computable. There was no computer simulation of that, of that universe. Not a real universe, a made-up universe. But there was it, no way of predicting what will happen until it happens. Well, you can't, yes. that's right. Yes. You, you, there's, no, well, you can't, there's no computer program which could simulate it, yeah. even though it's a purely you know, discrete process. And it, the, based on tiling with squares glued together into different shapes, you see. And as part of this, you have to have a tiling set which will only compute non, which will only tile the plane non-periodically. So I designed one with, with three different shapes, you see. So there's some slightly complicated shapes, which I'd worked on quite hard, developed from one of Robert Ammann's tiling ideas. And so I put this in one of my books, you see, um, as an example of a set of three t tiles, just polyominoes they're called, which will only tile the plane non-periodically. And in, in the Wolfram book, they give another set, which use, I think involves one fewer squares. And I talked to the chap who'd worked this out, and he was terribly pleased that he'd managed to reduce my one. <laughs> three tiles to another completely different set of three tiles, which one used was one set of one square. I think it was only one square, sim simpler than mine. <laughs> That's in the book somewhere. Yeah. We have, uh, the, this clock is slow, sadly, but so I think we have time for just one more question. There was another one, yes, here. It's related to the last but one question, but in, in Emperor's New Mind, you did speculate about the way dendrites on brain cells ah. would, would, would develop, and that would have a, a non-local nature. Uh, this could be related to the way quasi-crystals grow. Have you, has your thinking evolved on that since you, those speculations quite a yeah. number of years ago? <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, the quasi-crystals was just, you know, I started writing that book thinking that by, I got, by the time I got to the end of it, I would understand you know, <laughs> what was going on. <clears throat> of course, I didn't. Um, <laughs> but I had, to, I had to end it somewhat connecting it with something non-computable, so I 
just completely wildly suggested some quasi crystal idea. But not that I really believed that it would be anything like that. But then I learned later on. See, one of the things I was hoping that this book might do was stimulate young people to go into science or maths, you see. Well, I got lots and lots of letters from people, but they were old retired people. <laughs> <laughs> they were only, the only people who had time to read the book, you see. <laughs> the occasional one from young people, but then most of them went and did, did other things. It became quite distinguished. One of them became a very distinguished uh, singer. <laughs> but, um, uh, but on the other hand, my book was read by another scientist. This is one of the values of a sort of semi-popular book. It's not necessarily that it's the general public, but other scientists read it. So it was read by Stuart Hameroff, who was interested in, um, well, he's an anesthesiologist. But he's interested not only in, in, uh, in putting people to sleep, and that's his job, but interested in what he's actually doing when he's putting them to sleep <laughs> and why it is that they can be woken up again <laughs> and so on. Uh, so his idea was that what's really involved was, was the microtubules. So he, told, he wrote to me, and I get lots of cranky articles from people, you see, so, oh, no, another one of these, you see. And, and they said, it was microtubules, what on earth are they? And then, of course, I look them up, and are the pictures of them, they really do exist. And uh, so I thought, here's a much, much better chance than, than nerve signaling to, to create, um, to take advantage of quantum effects. Now, this was highly speculative, so we worked together in producing models on this, and lots of people were very speculative, you know, what a lot of crazy ideas, you see. Recently, within the last three years or so, there has been very interesting work done by an Indian called um, ba Anirban Bandyapadhyay, if I pronounce his name correctly, something like that. He works in Japan and does some extraordinary experiments on microtubules, individual microtubules, and he finds that they have very strange conducting properties for electricity. And, and, and they become highly conductive at certain curious frequencies in ways which are quite unlike ordinary materials. And it has to be something very quantum mechanical which is going on there. And so it's true that microtubules, at least in these artificial circumstances in the lab, and at, I should say, body temperature or higher, they behave in ways which are really impossible to explain purely classically. There is something funny going on which involves quantum mechanics. So it's an ongoing subject, and it's very interesting. These are very recent results. Uh, it's hard to know what's going on, but there's something strange going on which involves quantum mechanical processes. Whether it's got to do with consciousness is another question, but, uh, but that's the idea that it should have. Well, we, we have to draw things to a close there, I'm afraid. I never knew we'd get on to consciousness, but I'm glad we did. <laughs> um, so so uh, I'd like to uh, just, just thank Jill Metcalf for helping to make this talk happen tonight. And I hope that uh, many of you, whether retired or not, will have time to read Roger's new book, which he's going to be signing outside. So thank you very much. <laughs>